I don't speak your nonsensical coffee lingo. Just give me the two largest cups of regular coffee you serve, I said to the young barista at the cafe next to my house, the guy looked about 20. In fact, they all seem to be about 20 years old here. Damn, I could barely remember myself at their AGE.IT didn't take him long to pour two cups of coffee after I paid in cash. All that was left for him to do was give me my change, but that's where the young man stumbled. He winced in agony when he had to count the money twice that I could see that the young man was annoyed with me for not paying with a credit card like everyone else. Well, sue me for being old-fashioned. Yes, I'm stubborn and not planning to change. I carried the two cups of coffee, along with my 57-year-old backside, to a free table in the back of the coffee shop. I only had to wait a couple of minutes before she entered, looked around for me, and headed to the table I occupied that I must admit, I was internally seething at how outrageously good she looked for her age. She was as old as me, but she looked about 10 years younger. Obviously, she had been hitting the gym and, in the time I hadn't seen her, had lost about 5 kilograms. Her hairstyle, as always expertly styled by her personal hairdresser, continued to add charm to her magnificent golden light hair that I didn't bother to show the proper politeness of getting up from the table when she approached. No way. She was lucky that I finally agreed to meet with her, five years after our divorce. Couldn't you have picked some normal place where they know how to make real coffee? I asked her instead of a greeting, with a fair amount of disgust in my voice. God, Tracy, these kids couldn't brew a decent cup of plain coffee, even if Juan Valdez himself were here showing them how to do it properly. Juan Valdez is a fictional character representing the Colombian coffee and all local farmers. She nervously smiled as she sat down on the stool opposite me. I don't want to argue, Ben, she began quietly, carefully choosing her words. I just want, some kind of closure, at last. You don't have to say anything, I know I messed up terribly. I kind of understood it then, and I definitely know it now. I took you for granted. I mistook your kindness for weakness. I turned us into me, because I was, let's face it, I was such a selfish brat, Tracy admitted. In the evenings, I sit alone in my apartment and watch something on TV. I can't even say what they show. I am alone. There's no one to talk to. Ben, I miss our conversations so much. I miss just the sound of your voice, and it doesn't even matter what you're talking about. I miss all those insignificant little things, fleeting touches, casual smiles. I always believed that you and I, that we would be together until the end. Even when I did what I did, I still thought we would be together for many, many years. I didn't interrupt her, letting her express what had apparently been building up inside her and needed to be released. I just listened. I never, not for a minute thought I would get caught. I fell for the bait of an experienced seducer. She hesitated, then hurried to correct herself. No, that's not entirely true. Yes, he was a skilled seducer, but it's not like I succumbed to his charm, she faltered, perhaps I willingly followed him because I was so foolish, a foolish and selfish idiot. Tracy said all this, intently studying her coffee cup. Throughout her monologue, she never once lifted her eyes to mind that as she paused in her stream of words and brought the cup to her lips, I silently watched her. How many times in our 27 years of marriage had I kissed those still beautifully outlined lips? I snapped out of it when I suddenly realized that she was now looking at me, as if expecting a response. You asked for this meeting, and it's your story that you wanted to tell, I said. I've asked to meet with you many times since you filed for divorce. Why did you agree to it now? She asked, setting her cup back on the table. Because it took me all this time to reach a state where I could talk to you without feeling like I want to strangle you, I replied honestly enough. I loved you with all my soul, and maybe I still do a little. You betrayed my love, for what? Cheap sex. Well, you got plenty of that. Besides throwing away love, you betrayed my trust. What did I do to deserve all this? 
I asked her the question that had long tormented me. Nothing, she quietly answered. It's not your fault, it happened because of me, it's all on my conscience. I wish I could pretend that by this moment I had moved on from this significant part of my life and didn't crave answers. Yes, I wish I could act like I left it all behind, but that would be far from the truth, they say the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. I still hadn't overcome my hatred, but I was on the path to indifference. All right, then tell me how it happened. And, most importantly, tell me why it all happened, I continued our long overdue conversation in a steady voice, pushing aside my barely sipped coffee. The, why, is simple, she began with a sigh. I had just turned fifty, and I felt, a bit old, a bit unwanted. You know, it creeps into your life so subtly, almost imperceptibly. In recent years, when I entered a room, men's heads didn't turn my way as often as they used to. I know, I know. She hurriedly added, interrupting herself. You always told and showed me that I was the most beautiful to you, but, sometimes we, women, want to be appreciated, by other people too. I think Edward saw that I needed him, Tracy continued after a short pause. We had been colleagues for many years and occasionally talked, but, suddenly, somehow, he became my best friend. We started talking almost every day, and our conversations gradually became deeper, more personal. Edward was a handsome guy, and several unmarried women from the office had dated him, giving him high marks. I knew he was a player, but I thought I was in control of the situation. Well, obviously, I was wrong. So, what, you just threw us away? I asked, feeling my stomach start to twist into a tight and cold knot. Well, it didn't happen that quickly, she replied. We had lunch together a few times, one or two dinners, when I told you I was working late, and many times we just had coffee. I knew what game he was playing, and yet I went along with it. How long did it last, Tracy? I croaked, my throat suddenly dry. About a year, I guess, she answered. When he finally got me into bed, it was thrilling. He was new, different from you, and, it was so wrong. Probably that's why I got over my guilt fairly quickly. Besides, since you suspected nothing, how could it hurt you? I never gave you less. And I never did anything with him that I wouldn't do with you. Tracy sighed again, pulled a napkin from the holder, and clenched it in her fingers. I know it sounds cliché, Ben, but it really was just sex. Yes, we had fun, but there was no talk of love. And there never was. So you're saying that your fun in bed outweighed our marriage vows? Just perfect, I said with a bitter laugh. Everything was going smoothly, and you would have never known if it weren't for that busybody from the neighborhood, she said with undisguised annoyance. If it wasn't for him, we would still be married, and both much happier. Why couldn't we just go back to the time when everything was good between us? I only caught her because my retired neighbor Ralph Gordon called me one day to report that my wife and some unknown man had entered my house in the middle of the day, and he thought it looked quite strange. Getting that tip off, I immediately jumped in my car and 20 minutes later caught Tracy and Edward having sex in my marital bed. I interrupted the pleasure party of this pair by swinging the back of my fist at the back of his head, causing their heads to collide like billiard balls, and they both ended up with concussions. I yelled, looming over the cowering couple for another five minutes, before finally kicking the lover and slamming the door shut. Because everything was over between us the minute I found out about your affair. A simple, sorry, can't erase the damage done, I replied to this not-so-smart woman. I made a mistake, a big mistake. I know you've made mistakes in your life too. Did you really have to escalate to a nuclear level of reaction? We could have overcome this, together, Tracy said in a pleading voice. Hardly, I grated. We were married for 27 years. What made you think I would give you my blessing for a year-long affair? Okay, I understand, but it happened five years ago. Five years, Ben. 
You're alone now. I'm alone. Our children are angry with both of us. Why can't we try again? We had 27 good years together, Tracy continued to persuade me. I wondered what she was hoping for. To be precise, I corrected her, we had 26 good years together. I can't say the last year was good for me. And you know that what you did was a betrayal, regardless of whether I found out about it or not, I added. By the way, what happened to your lover after I left? Tracy again raised her cup to her lips and took another sip of coffee. She saw that I was watching her intently, but still couldn't help flinching for a moment. A few months later, he left for another, younger and prettier woman. I told you, it was just sex, not love, she replied reluctantly, as if forcing the words out. Yes, yes, just a fun fling with someone else's wife, I replied tersely, and she, unable to bear it, averted her gaze, staring at the ceiling fan. Did I deserve such disrespect from you? No, you didn't, she whispered. I stood up and brought each of us a second cup of over-roasted, bitter coffee. Somehow, the awful taste of this drink seemed perfectly suited to our conversation that I and the last five years, Tracy and I managed to convincingly portray mutual cordiality the few times we met at family events, but I never stayed alone with her or engaged in conversations. God knows, she persistently tried to make me talk to her, but I skillfully managed to avoid any potentially dangerous situations, both for her and for myself. I still wasn't sure whether I would end up strangling her if we were alone, or just break down, drowning in a humiliating puddle of tears. Sometimes, I felt the urge to unleash my emotions, in one way or another, almost every minute. Surprisingly, the only place I didn't miss Tracy was the bedroom. Considering that in all 27 years of marriage I had never once looked at other women with desire, I had no idea about the modern, nightly habits of the American man over 50. Realistically assessing my attributes, I assumed that for someone like me, the potential choice in the female dating pool would be quite limited. What can you expect from an average-looking, average-height guy, earning a fairly average income, who can't boast that his equipment is as impressively long as a donkey's? Damn it, how surprised and even somewhat shocked I was when, from seemingly out of nowhere, single women began to appear around me, and many of them were not at all shy about saying what they wanted from me. I had no idea that there were significantly more single women over 50 than single men, and that many single men over 50 seemed to prefer younger women, resulting in fewer available male partners of the same age for single women over 50. Add to this the factors of decency and sociability, and the chances greatly increase for those men over 50 who are not afraid to meet and talk with unfamiliar women. This was never a problem for me, so in the last five years, I had as much diverse female company as I wanted. Who would have thought? I also had a choice regarding the type of contacts I wanted with the ladies, short-term or long-term. Not every woman was looking for her next husband. Some of my new female acquaintances, as well as some men, were only interested in bringing variety into their lives for a while. As for me, I dated both types. I wasn't necessarily on a mission to find the next Mrs. Ben Arniston, but at the same time, I wouldn't have objected if a lady worthy of that role magically appeared before me. The only absolute exclusion was the return of Tracy Arniston into my life. How does that saying go? Been there, done that, ripped my heart out and decorated her t-shirt with it as a trophy. So why are you alone, Tracy? I asked with some surprise. You still look great, so finding a man shouldn't be a problem for you. And you clearly aren't shy about meeting men. She gasped, and for the first time, I felt ashamed for having insulted her. Um... Actually, that's not what I meant, and you know it, I corrected myself, Tracy snorted in offense, but then had to admit that I was right. Maybe I don't want to meet another man. Maybe I've come to realize that I already met the right man, lost him, but now want to get him back, she said. I know I treated you terribly wrong, horribly wrong, but I also know you're a good person who believes in forgiveness. 
I know you believe in it. Because I know you better than anyone else. It took all my self-control not to raise my voice in the cafe. You're not a foolish woman, Tracy. Didn't you ever think about what would happen if you got caught? I growled through clenched teeth. No, I never thought I would get caught, she answered. We shouldn't have brought it into our home, I admit, that was a mistake. But it was the only time we did it there. Edward had been pressuring me for weeks to do it in our bed. In your bed. I knew what he wanted. I, just eventually weakened and gave in to his persuasions. Now I think that Ralph actually did a good thing as a friend when he told you about me. I know many people would just not get involved. Tracy paused for a moment, waiting for my reaction, but not getting any, she sighed again and continued her confession. In the cold light of day, I'm sorry, doesn't even come close to what I feel. God, I was so foolish and overconfident in so many ways. But despite all this, Ben, I want you to come back. I need you. Please, Ben. I will beg if I have to, her voice was close to breaking, and it carried notes of desperation. With just a hint of sympathy for her evident brokenness, I shook my head negatively, as Tracy carefully studied my face to gauge my response. There was no triumph or satisfaction in my words, no revenge, I was simply stating what was obvious to me. Please, Tracy, don't put us both in an awkward position. How about putting my feelings above your own for once? Just like you should have done five years ago. Actions have consequences. Sadly, you forgot about that, I said firmly, Tracy sniffled, and tears threatened to spill from her eyes. You're right, again, she said, the flicker of hidden hope in her eyes extinguishing. I won't bother you anymore. There was a time when that forlorn look would have compelled me to stand up and wrap her in a heartfelt embrace. I did feel a sharp pain for both of us as I watched her, not waiting for my reaction, stand up and, with her head down, leave the cafe. I watched Tracy's retreating figure, then continued to gaze at the door long after it had closed, until a well-dressed woman in her fifties approached my table and placed a cup of salted caramel latte in front of me. I know you hate our coffee, so I wanted you to leave on a tasty note, the woman said with a radiant smile on her face. You didn't tell her, did you? She asked, just to be sure. I didn't want to completely shatter her soul. Yes, there was a time when I longed to destroy her, but someone, convinced me I'm better than that. Though I still have my doubts if that's really true, I replied, smiling involuntarily. Circling the table, the woman sat on my knees, hugged me around the neck with one arm, and tenderly kissed me. I sneakily glanced at the wedding ring shimmering on her left hand. In two months, Sandy Caruso and I will get married. I have no doubts. And unlike the previous Mrs. Ben Arniston, this good person will always be my top priority, she said with convincing certainty. I know what it's like to lose the closest person. I watched one of them fade away in the hospital from cancer ten years ago. So, I will always put my man first, she cooed, giving me another infinitely loving kiss. I noticed several cafe workers bustling in the background, smiling as they saw me kissing their boss. The employees had never met me before, because, as I said, I don't drink coffee here, even though I'm in love with the owner that I never really thought about karma until I met Sandy on a bike ride about two years ago. I hadn't ridden a bike since childhood, but after my divorce, I found myself with a lot of free time. To stay in shape, I regularly went to the gym, but I wasn't a big fan of the cardio workouts there. When Tracy and I were still together, I once suggested buying bikes and riding together, but she wasn't interested at all. Once I was alone, as a refreshing shake-up in my post-marriage life, I decided to buy a good road bike and hit the road. Mostly I rode alone, but occasionally I joined organized group rides, among other health enthusiasts. However, I wasn't very good at finding John Henry trail markers, a distance marker for hiking and bike touring in the mountainous part of central Idaho, and on one such ride, I foolishly got off the track. 
While I was looking around, trying to figure out which way to pedal, this woman rode up to me and, slowing down, asked if I was part of the ride. When I said yes, she let out a melodious giggle. Then you need to turn your butt around and follow me back because you missed a right turn about half a mile back, said the fit stranger that I did as she instructed, and when I turned my bike around, she was right in front of me. With excited enthusiasm, I watched as a more than gorgeous backside, tightly wrapped in spandex cycling shorts, danced before my eyes as its owner periodically stood up in the saddle, vigorously pedaling. Hey, genius, stop staring at my butt and catch up so we can talk like adults while we ride, she threw back at me with a knowing smirk, for the next 36 miles, we rode side by side at a fairly relaxed pace, sharing stories from our lives. I told her about my cheating wife, and she shared about her late husband who died of cancer. We both talked about our adult children, each of us had two, and about our grandchildren, Sandy had three, while I had just one. The total distance of our ride that day was 52 miles. The furthest I had ridden before that was 35 miles, but with a beautiful and interesting companion, all those miles flew by unnoticed. The following evening, we had a date, despite the fact that my leg muscles were incredibly sore, and I moved with some difficulty. Within two weeks, our relationship became exclusive, and on our fourth date, we shared a B.E.D. that M.Y. days as an aging single playboy were over. Ahead of me lay a life full of new colors and experiences, and the love of a wonderful lady who made my heart beat again. What are your thoughts on O.P.? Thank you for joining us in our tales where revenge is served piping hot. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more stories that guarantee your satisfaction. Stay tuned for the next one to satisfy your appetite for revenge. If you're under 18, brace yourself. It's not for the faint-hearted.